I wanted to talk about decentralized finance. To be more specific, how cryptocurrencies can bank the world. Well, you see, the answer, an immediate answer to this question, isn't very straightforward. And, you know, cryptocurrencies created this new segment called decentralized finance, but whether it will scale or not, whether it will help not thousands, but billions, is yet to be seen. So if that is something to happen in the future, let's start by understanding how we imagined the future in the past. Back in the late 1950s, a very talented artist, Arthur Rotterbaum, drew a series of futuristic sketches called Closer Than We Think. There are many available out there, but I picked a few to see whether we're actually that close to the future, or maybe we're already there. So let's take a look together. A jetpack mailman. Well, in late 1950s, we didn't know that email was coming, but um, jetpacks do exist, not a commercial level just yet, but this is very real. Automated warehouse robots, very real. Have you ever seen Amazon warehouses? Well, all of the logistic robots are interconnected. Space tourism, this is very exciting. I know with all of the great development, we are getting there, and probably we're closer than we think, yet still not there. Well, machines that understand speech. This is a fiction. My car still can't understand a word of what I'm trying to say. But jokes aside, Siri and Alexa will obviously agree that this is very real. But I wanted to stop on this one for a second. A one-world job market. Sounds very real, but is it so? Now, are jobs available to everyone with no regards to their physical location? No value, seamless value transfer? What about money transfer? What about dispute management? Now, if that all would be true, we would all live in the era for better finance. But we're not there yet. And you know how can I prove that? Because we all live in different worlds. Because the future becomes a reality, but only for a fraction of us. Financial inclusion may sound something very far from us, but in fact, it does affect us more than you think. Well, let me ask you some questions. How many of you here struggled to open a bank account because you don't have a birth certificate and you can't prove you legally exist? How many of you have ever had to walk 10 miles or more to the nearest bank branch just to receive the money? Well, how many of you were born or do live in the country that is in war and international money institutions do not operate and do not allow you to send or receive money? Well, none of us here belong to 1.7 billion people around the world that struggle with that every single day. Now, this is the number provided for only adults calculated by the World Bank back in November 2018. And if you ask me, well, 1.7 billion, is that a lot? It is, because it's 22% of the entire global population. Every fourth person on the planet is financially excluded. But you know what shocked me more is that two-thirds of those people have mobile phones. So access to finance, just like access to internet nowadays, is just one of the basic human needs. It could actually make us all richer. Now, according to the Bankov's law, the value of the global GDPR is quadratically correlated to the number of economically involved people. So now that we know how big the problem is, and we know the effect of it, how do we solve it? Well, there's one little thing called blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Now, a blockchain is a decentralized technology that allows you to record cryptocurrency transactions. Now, cryptocurrency, or cryptographic currency, is a virtual tool used to store the information in those blocks. Now, cryptocurrency is, um, well, it's a simply mathematical representation of the value you encode into it. What it means is that you can assign it to and by any asset. They can have monetary value, or they can be used as your me measure of wealth. Blockchains on the other side can't be used as your measure of wealth, but they can, use, um, they can be served as a measure of storing information. So with that being said, cryptocurrencies, they can relate to anything. So it means that there's cryptocurrency pretty much for anything. There's a cryptocurrency called XRP, which allows for cheaper banking transactions made by Ripple. There's a cryptocurrency that fuels global computing power, ETH by Ethereum. There's a cryptocurrency that represents CO2 emissions and allows organizations and governments to exchange those quotas, like climate token. There's a cryptocurrency that is used to exchange other currencies. 
there's cryptocurrency that, is, that represents the value of digital items in video games, like wax. There's even a cryptocurrency that represents the US dollar, like Tether. There are cryptocurrencies that are designed and built specifically for cheaper and more efficient voting. Perhaps let's take a closer look at that case because it looks very interesting. Now, many of you probably seen that once you make a purchase at Tesco, you're giving those blue chip tokens that you can then put into the jar to decide where the donation money should go to. Well, blockchain-based uh, voting solutions are designed to bring that offline process into the digital world and make it even more transparent and more efficient. Now, how do those things work? Well, at first, a blockchain-based voting system has to authenticate a user to validate that the user is unique and authentic. And once they're done, a user is eligible to cast a vote. Now, once an authenticated user receives a token that represents their right to vote, a user is also given the list of digital addresses that represents their candidate or an answer to a specific ballot question. Now, the token itself does not represent who cast them, so the votes remain anonymous. And then as soon as the person does cast the vote, now, that information of that act is stored simultaneously across many and many computers, makes it much harder for hackers to alter the voting system. What's unique about it is that even if it happens, we can clearly identify when and where it happened. So it makes it completely useless. Now, once you cast a vote, you're giving a digital code, the unique code that serves as a proof that you've actually cast the vote, that you can go and check and confirm that the vote has been counted as intended, and your vote has actually been counted towards the candidate or an answer that you've intended to. Now, at this point, you may ask me, if anybody can create this cryptocurrency, and it's an amazing technology that is open and available to everyone, can Banbury create one? Well, in fact, yes. Let's think about for a second how it would even work. Well, anybody who has a council tax bill from Banbury could automatically prove that they're a Banbury resident. It's a known limited number, so we can issue those tokens to the residents to allow them for a quick anonymous vote right from their mobile phones. Amazing, sounds very futuristic. Well, in fact, the city of Zug in Switzerland performed community-based um, blockchain voting back in 2018. Let's zoom out here for a second. Why does it even matter to me? Well, we have to go back in five years, and it's a three-and-a-half-hour flight from here to eastern part of Ukraine. Now, there are two cities. One is called Dnipro, the other one is called Donetsk, which are separated only by 160 miles. And 160 miles, just for reference, is just like from here to Dover. Not far, right? Well, back in 2014, those two cities were were living, and there still are, living in two different worlds. Now, the people in Dnipro, they kept using their banking cards, they kept walking to their branches, um, just, just as they normally would used to, whereas people in Donetsk became completely excluded. When I say completely, I mean that they weren't able to purchase anything online, they weren't able to repay the loans, they weren't even able to take the money out of the ATM. Now, they were completely cut out from the global economy. How that could happen, and so fast? Well, the answer is very simple, the sanctions. Now that the territory where the Donetsk was, was not under the control of Ukraine, of the state, international money institutions were not allowed to operate in that region, neither they wanted to. And that created the problem. And the idea of my talk today is to talk about specific strategic problems and the ways to overcome them. So let's take you know, a closer look at some of them. Lack of infrastructure. When I say that, I mean a lack of ATMs, branches, you know, physical um, machines that would allow us to transfer money easily. Now, the very first ATM in Mogadishu, which is the uh, capital of Somali, was only opened in 2014. And if you ask me, there aren't many records of any further development about this. So remember that quote from the World Bank, that two-thirds of all unbanked people have mobile phones. Well. Why don't we utilize that? Why don't we use distributed applications that would allow us seamless money transfer right from our mobile phones? Identity crisis. According to another research by the World Bank, 
out of those 1.7 billion people, there's a bit more than a billion people in the world today that struggle proving who they are. In other words, they're lacking their government-issued documents, whether it will be a passport or a proof of birth, anything. What it means is that they legally do not exist for their governments. What it turns out to is that they simply cannot open the bank accounts because the banks would not accept any other form of identification that they have. So how do we tackle this? Well, decentralized identities can serve as a replacement for a traditional uh, verifiers or form of uh, user identification. What it also means is that you are more than your passport. There are more ways to create the guaranteed proof of identity. No fair access to remote work. What blockchain allowed us to finally create a situation where two parties can safely execute work and provide value to each other with no third party to be handling the dispute. Now, in that event, the blockchain, or, well, in other words, smart contracts, would initiate the logic that would help us solve the disputes. So you don't have to trust your party or counterparty anymore. The, you don't even have to trust the system that you're using. The logic is transparent and is verifiable by everyone. Whenever we are dealing with British pound, euro, or the US dollar on a daily basis, we're far from experiencing, well, staggering um, money inflation problems. Well, in fact, if you look into Venezuela, uh, by International Money Fund, the hyperinflation in that country has reached a staggering 10 million percent only by the end of 2019. What it means is that throughout the year, the local fiat currency, Venezuelan Bolivar, lost 99 percent of its value. And cryptocurrencies are finally giving you know, a people of Venezuela their democratic option to store their measure of wealth. Now, this is a chart that shows the activity of one of the local popular decentralized crypto exchanges that allows people to buy and sell cryptocurrencies. And you can see the spike in that activity coming up the harder the local fiat currency boulevard drops. And it's all, not only the developing or stagnating economies that are experiencing this rise in cryptocurrencies. This is exactly the same crypto exchange, which is just one of the many. And look at this world stat. So you can see that the interest is constantly rising. So you may ask me, how do we participate? How can a person in a local town, a community, a country, can create this value both locally and globally? Well, I can tell you, if you learn about crypto, if you learn how to buy it, how to sell it, how to use it, if you learn how to operate with it, you can create that value. So how do you access crypto? Well, there's many ways to do that. There's more than 300 crypto ATMs around the UK now, and that number is growing. There's, of course, peer-to-peer -peer exchanges where you, as a person, can directly um, operate with another person that is willing to exchange those cryptocurrencies. And the terms and conditions of how you exchange it is strictly belong to both of you. So there's no intermediary party. There are also centralized crypto exchanges, which are under control of one party or operator. And there are decentralized exchanges, which are not controlled by one single party. They could be controlled either by a code, so software, or by a group of people or consensus of companies. Of course, there's ODC, which is over-the-counter trading, which comes from the stock market trading, uh, which serves for a larger volumes. But my interesting point here is the wallets. There are many and many out of them there. Some of them simply allow you to store, so send and store cryptocurrencies. Some allow you to buy. Some allow you to create, um, they're physical, they're digital, they're paperless or paper-based. There are many, many out of them. And the point of today's conversation is, now that we know that this problem exists, now that we know the size of this problem, now that we know what consequences can be created if we try to find and execute the solution, my question to you today is, what would the world look like if every person on the planet was financially included? Thank you.